have to I got no problem. <laughs> if it had been the other end now, uh, that would have been a bad problem. problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll shut up. No thanks to us. Well, I, I've got a few stories I can share with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I made Baptist out of two of my I drowned. Them. <laughs> it's good to see you tonight. I'm grateful that you're here, and we sure enjoy the food tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that you had all that you could handle because there was a lot of it back there. Still and there. Before we get started in our study time, we, of course, want to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Sister Elaine said, well, I'll go that her sister is doing better. Mm -hmm. And let's remember her sister and brother-in-law yes, uh, for their physical needs. Uh, other requests that you know of, that Brother Johnny and Sister Sharon, have you heard anything like that? Uh, they've moved him into a regular room today, so uh, continue to remember him and Sharon too. Okay. And uh, Miss Ann Comstock Debank, uh, she's had surgery, she's had some other issues, and she's been in St. Thomas really, really sick. And uh, remember her, and uh, then remember Miss Nettie's family, they buried uh, Brother Danny, would you word our prayer for us tonight, brother? Most gracious, oh, and heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before thee tonight. Ask me, Lord, to look down upon us, Lord, Father, and be with us. Be with the teachers, Lord, here tonight, that they might teach, Lord, upon that the things for us, Father, we might learn and learn to live with, Lord, and learn to die by. Father, go with us, be with us, be with the sick, be with everyone that's on our prayer list here. So, Lord, most especially, Lord, Father, we ask you, Lord, Father, to be with the lost. Father, that they might be, make an offer, Lord, and be saved before it's everlasting too late. Go with us, Lord, Father, now we ask it for thy sake. Amen. 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 Open your Bibles, please, back to 1 John chapter 4. several occasions already in our study about this matter of uh, 1 John and his epistle that he wrote uh, to let us know as believers that we can know that we are born again, that we have eternal life and the Spirit of God dwells within us. Sometimes as believers we encounter things that are very difficult. Sickness, financial problems, family stresses, national emergencies. There's things that happen to us in life, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, those things just happen. And sometimes when the pressures of those things get very heavy and weighted on us, even as believers, we begin to think, well now, am I really saved? Well, that's what the devil wants you to believe. Mm -hmm. He wants you to doubt. And as I mentioned, even last week, there's not a sin in asking God why. You know, you go back to the book of Job, but Job asked the Lord why. He wanted to know why he was having to go through all those things. And that's a normal thing for anybody under circumstances and pressures in life. That's just a normal thing. But when we begin to doubt God and begin to get critical, then you get into that sinful area where he wants you to back up and think about it and think about what he's done. The reality is God doesn't have to prove his love to anybody. He already took care of that on Calvary. Amen. Amen. You know, if we can't uh, imagine in our heart the greatest gift that could possibly be given to humanity, the death of his son on Calvary, in a sacrificial way, and if we can't see that as God's greatness and his great love wherewith the Bible says he loved us, if we can't understand that God loves us in such a dramatic way, it's really hard to understand how that we could be saved forever. And tonight, John's going to tell us about some of those things to re-encourage us, to re-inform us, to help us feel strong and have a boldness. You know, there's some people, some in the Christian world, that say, uh, you Baptists are just a bunch of hard-headed people because you believe once saved, always saved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
If anything I've learned from the Bible, that's one of the first hard rock doctrines I learned because I had to know. I didn't want a, a part-time salvation. I needed to know all the time <laughs> that I was saved from all my sin and forever. And once we have that embedded in our heart, spiritually speaking, we can begin to serve him and love him because we don't have fear. You know, perfect love, we'll see tonight, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a child of God and you're always worrying and doubting and fearful, you need to examine your relationship with the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you're not saved. Very possibly you are saved. But God doesn't want you to live in fear. Let me just give a simple example. What if you're a father or mother? Would you want your children to live in fear all their life? Absolutely not. And God's love is a billion times greater than any human love. And he certainly does not want us to fear. Right. So John, having ministered with the Lord, having knew the Lord in a personal way, in John chapter 1, verse 1, he begins to talk about seeing him, touching him, living with him. So John is writing to us as a witness to let us know, just as John had those those uh, strong feelings of a boldness because of his relationship with Christ, we can too. Mm -hmm. And so let's go ahead and read our introduction of, of our study sheet, and then we'll begin looking at verse 7 and 8. The remainder of this chapter deals with a perfect love, loving like Jesus loves. Although John's epistle, he is pointing out in so many ways the perfect kind of love every believer should demonstrate. Just as God loves us, he wants us to demonstrate that love to other people. Amen. He also explains that one of the greatest tests of anyone's experience of the new birth and Christ living within them is the capacity to love others. Think about that. You now have the mechanism and capacity within you to love others as the Lord loved you. Now, I must admit, we have to practice that. <laughs> it does not come naturally. It comes supernaturally. And so the flesh will not learn. You know, the flesh loves its own. That's what the world does. It loves its own, Jesus said. But as Christians, we're to love everybody. We're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're also to love our enemies. Love our neighbor. To love one another, he said, as I've loved you. Now, it's the greatest evidence that we are in a true fellowship with the Father as a son and a joint heir with Jesus when we learn how to love others, when we demonstrate the love of Christ in us well, that's pretty good evidence that you're saved. Now, love bestowed in verses 7 and 8. Let's look back at verse 7 and 8. Be love, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not God, notice the contrary, he that loveth not God, it says, for God is love. We don't know God <laughs> as a believer if we don't have God's love in us and we pass that on. You just... It can't be a true believer. It just can't be. Because that's what God is. And if we say we know him, and if we say we have his love, and yet we cannot extend that, something's wrong with our testimony. Something's just not right. Now you'll notice on the study sheet, the term beloved is from the Greek text, and it's the word agapentos, and it literally means favored of God or loved of God. It is specifically used to denote those who belong to God through the new birth in Christ. When you're born again, you're not part of the family. The family of God, you're, of course, heir and joint heir with Jesus Christ. We know that. That's what the Scripture teaches us. Now, it is where the word agape is derived from. It means the kind of love that is of the will and not from the emotions. Now, don't get stuck and get upset with me. We all have emotions. Some of our emotions are well spent and wonderful, godly. But some of our emotions are not of the Lord. And you've got to understand that though you're born again, you've been through the new birth experience, and you're now the son of God or a daughter of God, and there you're going there with Jesus Christ, the problem is you still live in the flesh. You still live in this whole tabernacle of flesh. And you're going to have problems in the flesh the rest of your days. We've talked about that. And a lot of our emotions are in the flesh. For example, I've mentioned several, several lessons ago. If you were to take a picture of the human body and put it on a page and, and put an arrow on this side and take another arrow on this side and go inside the, 
image. And you put the devil over here because the devil always works through the things of the world and he stimulates the flesh. On the other hand, God inspires you through his precious Holy Spirit that's within you. And so there's that struggle. You've got the carnality of the flesh, you've got the spirit world, and that of the Lord. And the Lord is telling you through his Holy Spirit, love one another. And the devil said, he's not worthy of his love. Look what he is. Look what he does. Now, you see, if the devil convinces you of that, then what happens? You become a judge of what is right and wrong. And that's not your job. God has defined in his word what's right and wrong. And he doesn't want us to turn around and write new rules because he's already written them and we need to understand that. Notice back on our study sheet, if you would. Well, I talk about illustrating emotional love as contrasted against a willful love. Emotional love is when we see something with, a, uh, with our eyes that affects our emotions. And I was thinking about my wife in this, and I don't think she'll leave me by using her again because I've done that so much. I can't drive her away. I wouldn't want to. Nobody else would have me. But she said a long time back after we buried that last puppy up in, up in Ohio, and I thought, well, that'd be the last puppy we'd have to have. And a while back, she started saying, I want a puppy. I want a dog. I don't care if it's from the pound or a stray or something. I want a dog. I said, honey, we don't need a dog. We're on the go all the time. We're busy all the time. We've got things to do. We've got responsibility. And I love dogs just as much she does. But I didn't want another mouth to feed. I didn't want another thing to take care of. And suddenly the devil began to work on me. Or maybe it was the Lord. I'm not sure about which one of this. Because I'm thinking, you know, I need to treat her better than that. I got online, and Danny, you need to stay offline, brother. I saw you on there while doing this stuff. <laughs> it cost me 350 bucks in the puppy. <laughs> I found a puppy up in Cave City, Kentucky. Prettiest little thing, and I took it, put it on my phone, and I walked down and said, honey, look at there, what you think? She said, oh my goodness. Her emotions flooded her soul. No, it flooded her flesh. Oh, how cute. Oh, my goodness. I said, how do you like to go see? It? Yeah, boy, I mean, usually it takes her a while to get dressed. You know what? She was in that car in just no time. <laughs> we drove up there, and the minute that woman let her hold that puppy, I knew I had to pay for it. <laughs> had no choice. Now, those were not godly emotions. Those were human emotions. Now, there's nothing wrong with human emotions as long as it doesn't cause you to sin. And she didn't sin. But you see, there's a difference between emotions in the flesh that are stimulated by seeing a cute puppy and say, oh my goodness, isn't that precious? And godly emotions, they're always through the leadership of the Spirit about godly things, eternal things. So, what are we talking about? The love of God. God's love is not emotionally stimulated by the flesh because he's a spirit. And so God's love is stimulated by his character and who he is. And thank him for that. He doesn't look at a situation and say, oh my goodness, I just got to rush down there and help him. He does that on the basis of purity and holiness because he is holy. That's what the Bible says. So John is wanting us to understand that this thing called love the kind of love that you and I are to have as believers, is not stimulated by something we just see all the time and say, oh my goodness, I need to help. God has to put this in you to do the right thing. And if God wants you and I to help somebody, he will stimulate your spirit inside and let you know you need to do this. And so God's love is a willful love. He directs it to whom he will. And you know, the Bible tells us that God loves all men. He loves them all. The Bible says back in 1 Peter, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to what? Repentance. He wants all men to trust him and become part of his family. And so there's a special kind of love that God gives to us. And during the birth of the Holy Spirit, the new birth, we are flooded with his love. You know, when the Bible says God is love, that's who he is. That's his character. The greatest dynamic that human beings can ever express is that of love. But we cannot even come near to the love that God shows us. Look back on our study sheet. 
John wants us to reflect upon the love of God poured out upon us, his divine love bestowed upon us in the new birth. Go back to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 for just a moment. Notice what John says. He says, behold, and he means to fixate on this, to stare at this, to look at, to understand what's going on. John says, behold, what manner of a love Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him. The world doesn't understand us. You know, if you have a neighbor living next to you that's not a Christian, he or she doesn't understand what makes you tick. You know, I, I had a fellow years ago tell me, he says, why don't you go fishing anymore? Well, I used to fish and hunt on Sunday before I became a Christian. And you know what? I never felt bad about that because that's what the world does. They do things that they want to do, what stimulates them. But when I got saved, I began to feel a little bit guilty because... Sunday, I believe, is the Lord's Day. It belongs to Him. We're to honor that. But not only that, I began to realize that be a fisher of men is more important than a fisher of fish. Right. That's the important thing. God changes your perspective on those things. Look at verse number 11 of our text. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, what does it say? We ought to what? Also love one another. If God baptizes you in his love, if he fills you with his love through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you have the mechanism and the capacity to share that love with other people. Mm -hmm. And you can't say, well, if you just knew them, they're really hard to love. That might be, but that's where you need to work on it. And how do you work on that? You start praying for them. Pray for them. You know, when you pray for people that you don't like, you know what's going to happen? God will cause you to fall in love with them. You'll find out you'll wind up serving those people. Mm -hmm. And it will absolutely, I, I've had that happen. People I didn't like. And I started praying because I knew in my heart it wasn't the right thing. And as I began to pray, God began to show me their good qualities and why I needed to love them. And it was amazing how God changed me. He didn't necessarily change them. But it was me that needed to change, not them. Because here's the catch. You're going to find that most of the people around you in the world are not lovely people. There are some really good moral people. But a lot of them are just immoral and living in sin. And they could care less about your claim to know Christ. But if they see love coming out of you every time they see you, they'll begin to say, you know what? There's something real about this fellow. That's what happened to me and our family. God moved us into a next door to a young Baptist preacher. And I couldn't stand him at first because he aggravated the fire out of me. Go to church. Do this. Do this. And I said, you just stay on your yard. But little by little as I watched him, I could not find fault in him. I could find Christ in him. And the Lord used that testimony to lead me to Calvary as a hard-headed man. And beloved, that's exactly what God wants us to do is find out how to love others so that it will draw them to the cross and to Christ and ultimately to salvation. This kind of willful love does not pick and choose whom it may be given to as a as a child, whom it may be given to. And uh, we have to think about this because notice we freely received. Freely received. You didn't pay for it. You couldn't pay for it. It was God's grace gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is what? The gift of God. Not of works less mentioned, but it's God's love gives to us. And John is saying that to whom are the beloved of God certainly should extend their love to us. So if you're God's child, if you belong to the Lord, it's mandatory that you and I love other people. We don't have a choice. We just have to. Now, verse 8, love is consistent with the character of God, who he is and what he is. And to everyone born of God, his love is bestowed upon them. Therefore, love should be a consistent characteristic of every believer. We should be identified by that. People look at us and should say, well, he's a stubborn old man. They should, should say, you know what? It's fascinating how he seems to love people. That's the way it ought to be. We are to love because he is the giver of that love. And if you're unable to love others, you do not know God, nor have you experienced the new birth. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? That's what the Bible's teaching. 
If you cannot love others for whatever reason you want to come across with, you don't know the Lord. Because first of all, John said emphatically, God is love. <laughs> and the Bible says he loved us. And he tells us he's given us the spirit of his love that indwells us to help us to love other people. Amen. So if we don't love others, we've never really experienced a new birth. We've had an emotional seizure in the flesh where at some times we might have bowed our head and heart and said, Lord, forgive me. But deep in the depth of who we are, we really didn't mean it. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer. I know the answer for myself. But when I was a younger man, before I ever got saved, I got in some pretty tight predicaments a few times. And I prayed. I wasn't saved. I prayed, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll try to serve you. I didn't mean it. I just wanted to get out of it. You know, when the heat's turned on, we want it to be a little cooler. And so I would do just about anything and promise anything if you just get me out of this trouble. And as soon as I was free of that situation, I got all about it. God doesn't do business with people like that. God doesn't save people that way. When you come to Calvary and come to the cross and come to Christ, you've got to humble yourself like a small child. You've got to realize who you are and what you are and that you're void of anything righteous before you can experience that new birth. And that's why it's so difficult with so many people that enjoy this life and this world because they're not used to humbling themselves before anything or anybody. It's usually all about me. It's all about me. Notice back on our study sheet, love manifested. Let's read verses 9, 10, and 11 in our Bible. John said, and this was manifested or brought into light the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is, or literally by this manner, he says, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to, what? Love one another. Now, I've got down here, I've just captured this as love manifested. Love manifested. Make it visible. Now, don't go foaming at the mouth and drooling all over people trying to prove you love them. It means a sincerity. It means led by the Spirit. And you know, I have to, in my own way, and again, I can't speak for everybody, but when I try to start loving people, I have to find something that God will stipulate me about that will direct my attention and my love towards them instead of looking at the negative and trying to judge them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Have you ever looked at somebody and said, well, I don't do that. I'd never be caught doing that. Your thought pattern right then is as bad as you've already done it. Remember what Jesus said about looking on a woman? If you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. You see, our thoughts sometimes can be deep sin because of the intent. And when we look at somebody else, another person, maybe not even a Christian, and say, I'd never do what he just did. You are judging that person. And with that judgment, you can't love them. You can't love them. You're criticizing them. God wants to reverse that. He wants you to see yourself as you used to be before he cleaned you up. And then you compare yourself with Christ. Amen. Amen. When I look at my fellow neighbors in the community, I might say, well, I'm better than they are because I don't do this, I do this and that and so forth. But when God says, look at Calvary, look at my son, his perfection, I'm like the apostle Paul, the wretched man that I am. You see, you really see yourself, and you've heard me say so many times that there's two viewpoints. There's the world's viewpoint, how they see things, and there's the divine viewpoint, how God sees it. God sees reality and the world sees falsehood. The world sees phoniness. And so when we look at the world and say, well, I'm better than he is, I don't do this. God said, no, you need to look the other way. Look to my son, look at his purity, and then you'll see yourself as God sees you. And boy, when we see ourselves as God sees us, it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts because we realize we're not very worthy of anything except condemnation, but God still loves us. 
And what a blessing. Now, love manifests verses 9 through 11. Notice, if you will, unregenerate people, people who have not been saved, possess a slanted viewpoint of love, and they do not know God's love with their carnal mind. They can't understand the love of God. That's why when you try to talk to somebody that's lost about being saved, and you start talking about Calvary and about Jesus and the things that they need to hear, they're thinking with that carnal mind. They can't understand the love gift that God did in his son and put him on the cross. They can't understand that. And it's hard for them to reach him because, after all, we don't see that kind of love on this earth, do we? No. People don't give away their sons to be slain for somebody else. It doesn't happen. They only see what they want to see because they have never experienced God. You hear people say, well, if God is really a God of love, how can this and that happen? Or why doesn't he prevent all the bad things from happening? I've had that asked of me as a pastor more times than I could count. Preacher, I want to ask you something. They draw me off on one side and say, oh, well, now, why is this happening? That fellow is really a good man. He is really a good man. Look what's happening to him. Why does that happen? And I have to be honest and just say, I don't know. You know, bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good things happen to bad people. We don't know. But people will try to say, well, now, if God is really real, if he's really alive, why does he allow wars? Why does he allow children to be murdered? Why does he allow thievery? I can't answer those questions. Except for one thing. It's called sin. It's called the depravity of man. That's why we need God. First of all, God is not subject to the carnal thoughts of sinful things for happening. First of all, listen, he doesn't cater to human definition. People look at something and say, well, that's not really all that bad. God says, rotten to the core. Remember what he says about human righteousness? It's as filthy as rags, filthy rags. Now notice, when we get to talk about God, it's God who defines what true love is. John said God is love. And his love was manifested when he sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might through, live through him. God's love became supremely visible in Jesus and upon the sacrifice on the cross. You know, when you think back in your mind and you look to Calvary and see what happened to Jesus, oh my word, it just, it makes you want to cry. I don't know if any of y'all saw The Passion of Christ. I'm not here to tell you it was a fantastic movie or a bad movie. I'm just simply telling you, as you look at it, it's really hard to watch it. We know it's an actor playing a role, but it's heartbreaking because we know in reality that happened to our Savior. And it didn't happen because of anybody else. It happened because of me. I don't know about you. It happened because of me. And when we think about that, it shows us the love that God shed upon us because he was willing to do what he did with his son on that cross. Now, there are many manifestations of God's love evidenced in all the wonder and beauty of life. Many times our pastor, Brother Tim, I've heard him refer to this, being out in the field, being over by a creek, being somewhere mowing a yard, and all of a sudden you feel the presence of God in your life. One of the strongest episodes I ever had was over in Israel on the Sea of Galilee. We were in a boat going across the sea, going from Tiberias across to Capernaum. And they stopped that vessel right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they turned the motors off, the diesel motors. And there's a mob of Germans on the boat with us. There's folks from Germany and folks from the United States. There's probably about 120 of us all together on that boat, big boat. They stopped there. They turned the ignition of those motors off, and everything was quiet. The water was still. And you just look around and you can just think about that Jesus walked on this water. He walked here. And all of a sudden, one of our ladies that was from one of our Florida churches, she had a beautiful voice. She started singing an a cappella, Amazing Grace. Well, everybody started joining in. And you know what? The German folks started singing it in their language. They heard the melody, they heard the rhythm, and they started singing. And all of us, 100, 120 people, were singing Amazing Grace on that boat. It was just going out across that Sea of Galilee, it's just incredible. I saw Calvary, went to the place where Calvary was, went where Jesus hopefully was buried in that particular place, went all over Israel on a tour. You got back home and you what people said, did you ever feel the presence of God at Calvary? I said, well now, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'd like to say I felt it more at Calvary than any place else, but I didn't. It was on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> where I felt his presence stronger than any other place. I said, I stood at Calvary and cried. 
but the presence of him touching me, spiritually speaking, happened on the boat in Galilee. And I said, he was there with all of us. He was there with everyone. And I said, even our lost Israeli tour guides. But what an experience it is, because the amazing thing is, no matter where you are and what you're doing, God can express his presence and his love in your heart. And you don't even know that he's there. But he's there. <coughs> Notice, many manifested to God love this evidence of the wonder and beauty of life. Look around us. Look at the hummingbirds. Daughter-in-law, when we talked to her on the phone just a day or two ago, she said, have y'all got any hummingbirds yet? Crystal said, well, I think I've seen one. Isn't it amazing how those little beautiful creatures, so tiny, buzz around and you feed them on your back porch or deck or whatever? And you get to think about God's creation, that he cared enough about something so small as a little hummingbird? or a deer, or a mule, or a farmer. I mean, God evidences his, his love all through creation. You, you just can't look around and not see the love of God unless you've never experienced it. If you're not saved, you might say, isn't that coincidental? You know, back when things were evolving, after the Big Bang Theory, and animals began to crawl out of the sea, you know, when people have that philosophy, they can't see the love of God. They can't see that he's the creator. I got a poem written in one of the old Bibles on the front. Once I was a polywog beginning to begin. And then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. And then I was a monkey swinging through a tree. And now I'm a professor with a PhD. You see, that's the philosophy of men. We came out of a cesspool of mud somewhere, crawled up on the beach, and started developing arms and legs, started walking and talking. That's not right. We're here because of God's love. Amen. He chose to create and duplicate himself. The Bible says that we are created in the image of God. It's amazing. Well, we can't see God. No, it means that we're created in his image by what we are as living beings. And he wants to fellowship with us. And we have to know him. We have to belong to him. However, the greatest evidence of his love is seen in redemption. The preeminent manifestation of God's love is evidence in the gift of the only begotten son whom he sent to save us. There is no greater gift than God's unspeakable gift. He sent Jesus into the world in the incarnation so that we might live through him, so that we might be recipients of eternal life. That's why Christ came. To seek and to save the lost, to give us eternal life. That's why he came. If God was so willing to manifest his love to humanity by a sacrificial gift, why then should we not show our love to others in the same spirit of sacrifice? You know, love is expensive. I had never bought a diamond ring until I married Crystal. I paid a lot of money for that. I sure did. I borrowed $200 to buy it. Yeah. When we got married, Zales Jewelry in Tampa, Florida, that was a lot of money to a girl made $40 a week. But she was worth it. And since then, I've realized that's not where happiness is. In buying and giving gifts. You see, that, that shows the love of the flesh. But real love is demonstrated in sacrifice in a different way. Not sacrificing your treasures and your time, but sacrificing yourself. That's God's love. He sacrificed himself. And that's how he wants us to manifest that. If God was so willing to manifest his love to humanity by sacrificial gift, why then should we not show our love to others in the same spirit of sacrifice? That is why John mentions Christ's propitiation for our sins in this verse. Jesus took our punishment and became every human substitute on Calvary's cruel cross. If God so loved us, then love should be our testimony as we love one another. Our testimony. Verses 12 and 13. Love makes an invisible God visible. This is interesting. Verse 12, John says, No man hath seen God at any time. 
And I've met people that told me that they've seen it. What am I to believe? I'm believing the word to say. Mm -hmm. I can't believe what people say. Remember what the Bible says, let God be true and all men be what? Liars. Liars. Mm -hmm. A missionary buddy of mine told me, he said, I don't understand, Brother Sarah. Why will some men climb a tree and tell a liar rather than tell you the truth standing on the ground? <laughs> yeah. That's the flesh. Now, notice in that verse again. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells within us, and his love is perfected in us. And notice that next verse. Hereby, or by this manner, know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. The spirit of Christ, the spirit of the Holy Spirit. Why is John telling us what we already know in this verse? We know that God is love. We know that. But John wants us to really think about it. We know that God is a spirit and we know he's invisible to the human eye. And it really is simple. Our unseen God becomes visible only when unbelievers see him and the love of believers. Now think about that. If we don't get any other thought tonight, that's the most important thought of this chapter. If we, if we truly serve an invisible God, and we do, our friends and neighbors will never see him visibly. But if they see you loving them in all kinds of different ways, they're seeing God. They're seeing God. You know, when Philip, up in that upper room in John chapter 14, they were distressed about the fact that Jesus was about to depart. They didn't know where, they didn't know why, they didn't understand any of that about his crucifixion. They just didn't get it. And he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, show us the Father. And he said, it suffices us. It, it'll, it'll satisfy us. And he said, now I'll ask you a question. He said, haven't I been with you such a long time that you don't understand that I and the Father are one? We're one. Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. Look at me. And we need to be able to tell our neighbors, not by saying it, because talk is cheap. But we need to be able to say to our lovers, our, our neighbors, if you want to see really that God's really real, watch my life. Now, brother and sister, we've got to, we've got to be sincere about it. If they're going to see the Lord in us, we've got to really love them through the love that God's given us, not through the carnality of the flesh. People can see if God is perfecting his love in us when we share it. You know, when people watch you mature, in Christ. They can see you growing. They can see the love being manifested in you and out through you. They can see that. No greater thrill, I, I should not say this, this is my opinion, not worth much. This is 100 bucks to get you a really good sandwich. But I think that the greatest treasure that a pastor experiences it's not just when somebody gets saved. I mean, that's as good as it gets. But there's something else that's absolutely wonderful. When you're a pastor and you stand before people week after week after week and you preach and you teach God's word, and little by little, the pastor begins to see the maturity of the people that he is preaching and teaching to, that's his reward. He sees them grow. Illustrate. You're raising your children. And you tell them over and over again, don't do that, do this, don't do that, this is dangerous, this will hurt you, this is good for you. And they, they behave like a bunch of little wild squirrels. And little by little, you begin to see them doing the things that you've been trying to teach them for the longest time. And you stand back and what? <laughs> That's my boy. That's my girl. The joy of people living by things that you have presented is one of the greatest rewards that a pastor can ever know because it lets him know I'm doing the right thing. And sometimes it's not easy, but boy, what a blessing. They can see his power at work when they see our trusting faith during life storms. You know, when the world is frantic about, oh, that tornado's coming this way, I, I don't know what to do, I, oh, what are we gonna do? And you just panic. You shouldn't be afraid of a tornado, it can kill you. 
But the important thing is, you say, well, it might destroy us, it might take our home. That's okay, I know where I'm going. The greatest thing for a child of God, I know where I'm going. Amen. And I know why. That's the point. If we love one another, God is on display. He says, by this, Jesus said, think about it. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. The greatest manifestation of the love of God in people is that they love others. By loving others, God's love is perfected in us and thereby reveals to them that he is living in us. He abides in us and our love abides through him and it becomes very real. God, though he's invisible, it becomes a revelation that he is there. He is real. It really reveals who he is as an invisible God. Not only has God loved us, he has also given us an example of how to love. God's love was sacrificially given in a way in which it would reveal who he was to those that could never see him. You and I would never be saved if God hadn't taken the first step. He steps in our direction. And he's always, I told one of our church members several years ago, they were worried about their grandchildren, constantly worried about grandchildren. And I said, listen, the best you can do is pray for them and share the things of the Lord with them. But you've got to understand one thing. God loves them much more than you do, and he wants them there, and he's going to do all that he can do to get them there. And so you be faithful to pray, you be faithful to set an example, but he'll, he'll do the work. He's going to have to do the work. And it's, it's just that way. We, we sometimes want to do all that we can, and rightfully so, but there comes a time that we're having to leave it in God's hands and say, Lord, please, just please do what I can't do. And if you're a true Christian, you have the capacity to love, you have his example to love, and you have the responsibility to love, because that's how you prove you belong to God, is through love. That's how you express his love and sacrificial service to others, and that's how you witness to the watching world and love becomes core issue to the Christian life experience. That's the core thing. That's what we are, and that's what we're made of. It's so important. Verses 13 through 16, the abiding witness that is within. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. The abiding witness within, that permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's there for a purpose. Verse 13 begins with the assurance that you can know that you're saved by the witness God has placed within you at the new birth. Now I want you to think about something. Next time that you begin to doubt your salvation, stop and think for just a moment. I know that I've experienced a new birth, and here's how I know I have. Because before I was saved, I could sin, and it never bothered me. But now when I sin, I feel like dirt. I feel awful. I feel guilty. I feel dirty. Now that is if you feel those things. Because when you're lost, you're just doing what lost people do. But when you got saved and the Spirit of God lives within you, He is not going to let you live free of the guilt of your sin when you sin. As you begin to sin, He's going to prompt you and He's going to convict you and He's going to try the best in His ministry to get you to see what you've just done contrary to the Word of God and how bad it really is. So, as a saved person, there's times when you feel like, well, now, if I'm saved, why would I do that? Well, first of all, if you was lost, you wouldn't even worry about that. Amen? Mm -hmm. I've asked that to myself many times. Why did you just do what you did? Why did you say that? Well, I had to stop and think about it. You know, when I was lost, I never said that. I didn't care. I wasn't trying to impress the Lord. But now that I've saved one of the strongest witnesses within my heart, is when I make bad choices and sin, I know it. I feel it. I sense it. And I'm not happy inside. And that's one of those assurances. And now here comes the spiritual icing on the cake, the unmistakable way you and I can know without any doubt that we have been born again, 
We can know that we have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us as we read these next few verses. First, John said in verse 14, We have seen and do testify that the Father sent his Son uh, to be the Savior of the world. This statement is an emphatic registered testimony of eyewitnesses. Now, John, the disciples and the apostles, they saw him. They saw the resurrected Christ. They ministered with him. They lived with him. They ate with him. They saw him. They saw the empty tomb, and they saw him after the resurrection. Back in 1 Corinthians, I believe in chapter 15, I think it talks about over 500 witnesses at one time who saw Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Folks, we don't have to doubt the word of God. Now, when John mentions we, he is speaking of those disciples and apostles that knew Jesus in a personal way. Now, why would they banking their life on what he had told them after he's gone to the cross and come back. Why would they tell a lie about that? They would be the most let down people on the face of the earth. Think about it. They followed him. They gave up their nets. They gave up their lives. They gave up everything to follow Jesus for those three and a half years. Now, if he died on the cross, and he did, and if he wasn't resurrected on that third day as he was, those would be the most disappointed men on the face of the earth because they had followed a phony. Amen. He was raised for what? Our justification, the Bible says. That tells us that because of his resurrection, now we are just right with our Heavenly Father. Just right, justified. You know, that's an incredible thought. We can trust their testimony, but there's more than just their eyewitness words. In verse 15, we find a conclusive statement bringing an argument of, uh, or a doubt to an end. John stated, Whosoever shall confess or let her agree that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. So when we're willing to confess him and we're willing to ask him to forgive us of our sin and to save us, he dwells within us. He is not only our God, but now he is our indwelling God. He is our personal God. In other words, and I've underlined this, it's your belief of the gospel that is evidence of the ministry of the presence of the Holy Spirit within you. If you believe the things that the Bible says about Jesus, you're saved. What do you mean? You know why lost people don't get saved? They don't believe this. That's it. They don't believe it. When I was baptized at eight years old, I believed that there was a Jesus. I believe the Bible talked about Jesus, but he wasn't my Jesus. I had never asked him to forgive me and save me. I wanted to be baptized, and that church did their own thing. They baptized a lost eight-year-old boy without really questioning him. Son, have you been saved? Have you been born again? They didn't ask me that. They baptized several of us kids after vacation Bible school in the baptistry. And I thought I was right with God until I was about 13. And then I began to realize that I was living and doing things that my parents didn't want me to do, and I'd sneak around and do it and try to hide. Not things to go to jail, they were things I probably should. And I'd lay in bed at night and feel guilty, but not guilty enough to say, Lord, forgive me and save me. I wasn't ready to humble myself and surrender as a 13-year-old boy. God saved me when I was 30. Shame on me. Shame on me. It took me a long time to come to the place that I would humble myself. I hear some of you brothers talk about six years old, eight years old, ten years old, and I sit there and think, boy, I sure wasted a lot of years. I wasted a lot of years. But you know what? I praise God that he saves 30-year-old men. Amen. I do. When you're able to believe the message, receive that message, and confess that truth, it's then that the new birth can occur within a person. But it has to be because the Spirit of God is dealing with you. Yes. If the Spirit of God's not dealing with you, a million miles stacked high of Bibles will do a thing for you. Right. It's the ministry of the Spirit. Isn't it amazing that the ministry to all the lost people of the whole world is given to one single Spirit, the Holy Spirit? Isn't it amazing that the whole sin of all the world, billions of people that have ever lived, is given down to the sacrificial death of one man, Jesus Christ? Right. Isn't that amazing? 
Isn't it amazing that only one God and Father could be the one to send that Son and give us that love gift? One God for billions of people. Folks, His power is undescribable. His love is un uncomparable. But you still have to realize that if he's not in you, you're blinded to all these things. Doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing. Love experience, so we're going to hurry and get through here. Verses 17 and 18. Herein, by this manner, is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, as Christ is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect fear casteth out, uh, perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. And you know that. When you're afraid of something, it torments you. He says that fear has torment. He says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. What is he saying? You see, we experience God's love through the new birth and his indwelling spirit who prompts us to love others as did Jesus. We are dwelling in him and his love dwelling in us. And just as Jesus lived in the world, think about it, just as he lived in the world <laughs> and his father's eyes were on him, you and I live in the same world and his eyes are on us. No different. He's watching us. Now, Jesus wasn't of this world system and neither are you and I. When you get saved, the things of the world should begin to dissipate away from you. Begin to get out of your life. And I'm not talking about having a car or having a boat. Those, those things are not sinful. It's how you use those things that could be sinful. You could have all kinds of fine things. Not necessarily sin. But if they have you, it becomes a sin. Nothing wrong with baseball. But some people worship the God of baseball every Sunday when it's being played in the field somewhere, or maybe on TV, rather than coming to the Lord's house on the Lord's day. That's sin. That's sin. Nothing wrong with baseball, but it's the attitude behind it, the things of the world. Jesus wasn't of this world system, and neither are we. As Jesus was in the eyes of his Father, so are we in the eyes of the Father. As the Father's love was in his Son, even so is his love in us. We do not fear judgment because God's love is perfected and dwells within us, causing us to look for his return with joy. And stood. I'm not afraid of God's judgment. Uh, he took care of that on Calvary. You know, the most incredible thought is when Jesus, and, and a lot of Christians don't get this, and I don't mean to be naughty about this, but Jesus died for every sin that shall ever be committed. It's paid for but if you don't ask him to forgive you and be your savior, you're still dead in your trespasses and sin. Either Christ's blood paid for your debt, or you're going to pay for it. Amen? Amen. One of you. You're going to accept the free payment of his sin sacrifice and his blood, death, burial, and resurrection. You're going, to, you're going to pay for it that way, or you're going to pay for it in eternity when you burn forever in a devil's hell. Amen. Because there's no other place. Mm -hmm. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. It's either the Lord's way or the devil's eternity. <laughs> One or the other. And when you're saved, perfect love casts out fear. You don't have to be afraid of judgment. And that's not arrogancy. That's trust. That's trust. Love returned, verses 19 through verse 21. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us, the Bible says. And if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a what? A liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, says, how in the world can he love God whom he has not seen? How can that be? How can a fellow sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and look at a fellow across the auditorium there and say, you know what, that brother, he just ticks me. Something wrong with that. Something wrong with that. And this commandment have we from him that he who loved, loveth God loves his brother also. Love returned. How can we return the love? You know, sometimes you hear people say, I wish I could repay God. We can't repay him, but there is one way that we can show how much we care and how much we love him. That's to love the brother. Mm -hmm. Love others. Love our enemy. We 
greatest thing that we can give to the Lord is to love others. Because that models who Jesus is and what Jesus did. If you want to live like Jesus, don't go to the cross. Go to your friend. Go to your neighbor. Go to that fellow that's unlovely. And do something good for them. Love them in spite of themselves. Because that's what God did for you and me. He loved us in spite of ourselves. Well, thank you for being here tonight. I hope we shared some things that will help you as a Christian to understand that when you say it's forever. It's not part-time. You can't lose it because you didn't birth yourself into the family of God. He did it. The evidence is, is, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The evidence is in nature all around us. The evidence is if you begin to love others like God loved others, that's an evidence that you know the Lord. You can't love everybody unless the Lord is loving them through you. Amen. Thank you. Let's bow our heads and we'll dismiss with prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Lord, I hope that in some people's way we try to illustrate the things that John was talking about and trying to bring to our mind as believers that we don't need to be afraid of the final judgment when we trust in Jesus Christ. We were judged in him. He paid the debt. And now we're to live in the newness of life. We're to live in Christ each day by being faithful and obedient to your leadership. Father, help us to love others like you loved us. We thank you, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. <laughs>